Good afternoon, everyone. It's Katie Crysdale here from Lakeview Aquatic Consultants. Thanks so much for being here today. It is Monday, March 22nd, and this is a different time for us. We don't normally meet in the afternoon, and I do sincerely apologize for the confusion. I was advertising everywhere on social media, on our website, that this session started at 2 p.m. Mountain. And then somebody kindly sent me an email this morning letting me know that the click meeting registration was listed for the normal time, 11 a.m. Mountain. So I apologize for that last minute change in the click meeting registration. This session was always scheduled for the afternoon based on speaker availability. And that's just, that's on me for not having that good attention to detail with all 14 webinars this month. We do have two sessions that are at this unique time. So today is one of them, Monday, March 22nd, as well as this upcoming Wednesday, two days from now, which is Wednesday, March 24th. That session will also be at a unique time based on our speaker joining us from Australia, where it will be 6 a.m. So thanks so much for being here uh, really excited to have today's speaker who will be coming on in about 15 minutes uh, definitely the back end of the day and hopefully we have some people who can join us to hear the session looking at uh, basically sweeteners in water how much do people pee in the water and how can we track these things so that will be coming up in just a little bit you can go and download the presentation slides from our presenter today, Dr. Lindsay Blackstock. She has made those available. So you can already head over to our website, like theaquaticconsultants.com, where we've got the 2020 Pool Aid webinar tab. And then, sorry, <laughs> clearly my brain's not firing. 2021 <laughs> webinar tab, and you can click on today's session and see all of the slides that she has made available. So let's talk about some of the other sessions that will be coming up as well as sessions that we had last week. So this is the penultimate week of the 2021 webinars. We have been running now for three weeks and we will be finishing next week on Wednesday, March 31st. Really excited by the caliber of presentations that we've had this year, some really dedicated presenters, some real experts in the industry sharing their perspectives on different content and different principles. So today is going to be more of a pool operations, water chemistry perspective. Coming up on Wednesday, we will have Ramzi Husseini he Australia. Ramzi Husseini is a lifeguard, swimming instructor, water safety advocate, drowning prevention ambassador for the Victoria Life Saving Society in Australia. Ramsey fled with his family from Afghanistan about 10 years ago and made their way by boat to Australia, where he was not... Um, he was definitely, he would say, not a water safe person. He did not know how to swim. He did not know much about water safety in Australia with the tides and the oceans and all of the tremendous hazards that exist for people who are not comfortable in and around water. Ramsey participated in a multicultural program that they run in Australia and became trained how to swim safely, how to become a lifeguard, and he's really taken to it in turning his life to be directed towards educating and advocating for those, um, uh, those people for whom water safety is maybe something they've never considered. So really excited that Ramzi Husseini will be joining us on Wednesday from Australia, and he will be talking about his multicultural perspectives on life-saving in Australia what that looks like. And I hope you can draw some parallels to different circumstances we are experiencing here in Canada with new Canadians, immigrant populations, refugee populations. And I'm sure the same thing applies in different parts of the United States, where there are people from communities who are settling in your area who may not have the same experience level or interest or cultural awareness of what it's like to be in and around water. So that's going to be coming up on uh, Wednesday. 
And I see Andrea here. Andrea, I want to give you a shout out for your email this morning where you told me that the link on our website was wrong for this session. So a big thanks to you for that. That's an unusual inattention to detail for me. So definitely appreciate that notification to update the registration today because that's just, it's unfortunate. I'm really excited about today's presenter and I hope some people are still able to join us. But if the time for them was this morning and it was it was marked, uh, it was changed at the last minute, I do also understand if we have a smaller group today. But as always, these sessions are being recorded and we were able to get out one recording last week for a Zoom session that I did. And I know our video guy is working away. Um, he works weekends at a different job and he's working on video editing this week. So keep an eye on our YouTube channel, hoping to get two or three videos up in the next week. And we will be working through all of the 2021 webinars in order. So they will all be on YouTube eventually. We just don't know when that will be at the moment. So coming up on Wednesday, that's going to be Ramsey Husseini. And then coming up on Friday is going to be Brent Miller from Automated Aquatics. He's going to be talking about indoor air quality. So indoor air quality is definitely a topic that people are talking about in the aquatics industry, in the commercial swimming pool industry. What does it mean to have our um, air quality be safe and appropriate for people who are spending long periods of time? Uh, exposed to the combined chlorine levels in the water, the chloramines in the air. How does that impact people's health and safety, as well as how does that impact pool operations? So you may have visited pools before that have a lot of rusting in the pool area, and that's based on poor air quality, poor ventilation, poor recirculation of the air, poor fresh air intake, a lot of these words may not necessarily make sense to you right away. So I would encourage you to join us on Friday at the normal time, 11 a.m. Mountain or 1 p.m. Eastern. We will be talking with Brent Miller from Automated Aquatics. He did a really excellent session last year for the 2020 Pool Aid webinars. He talked about reopening swimming pools after a prolonged, ex a prolonged closure due to the COVID lockdowns. And I know that is a recording that people continue to access on our YouTube channel. And it's, it's pretty classic at this point, even though who could have known, who could have anticipated 12 months ago that we would be reopening and closing all of our pools, sometimes repeatedly, depending on the, depending on the geographic location in Canada. So... That's uh, Friday's session will be Brent Miller from Automated Aquatics talking about uh, those things. That's coming up. Thanks to those of you who are here. Thanks to those of you who are just joining us. I know this is an unusual time and I apologize for the confusion with the last minute change in the schedule, the way it appeared on Click Meeting, and that was at odds with what I had advertised. So appreciate your patience and appreciate you being here, those of you who are able to be here at a different time for us. Let's look a little bit at what we did last week. So if you were here last week, we had three different sessions. So we had sessions on Monday, March 15th, Wednesday, March 17th, and Friday, March 19th. So Monday, March 15th, we had Jamie Lopes here from Aquatic Engineering and Design talking about some of the project gaps he encounters in new pool construction and renovation projects. So it was a high level overview of some of the different uh, project gaps that we see in these different uh, projects, <laughs> sorry, project gaps we see in these projects. Uh, and he provided a lot of great information about some of different areas for people to consider and being aware of what could happen if nobody is planning for them in their scope of work. So that recording will be up as soon as we can get to it. On Wednesday, March 17th, we had our St. Patrick's Day session with Josh Koch. 
who was talking about creating uh, service magic. Josh Koch talked a lot about his personal experience with um, Walt Disney World parks, amusement parks, the Disney Institute, Disney University, how his direct experience with Disney has brought him some guidance into the way that he develops customer service in his facilities, as well as working with his staff. So that was uh, Josh Koch on Wednesday, March 17th from uh, Strathcona County, which is in Alberta, just north of me outside of Edmonton. That was a longer session. So I know a lot of people are looking forward to that recording because he did about 75 minutes. But I really, as a host, like to provide our guests the opportunity to present the material in a way that is relevant to them without feeling shortchanged, if that makes sense. And so ensuring that people have the time to present as much as is necessary. Just keeping an eye on my phone because you never know, even though it's on silent, sometimes we get messages from presenters. So that was up on the 17th. Then on Friday, March 19th, we had a session uh, with Pam Wright. Sorry, sometimes it feels like things were a lifetime ago, even though they were only three or four days ago. So on Friday, March 19th, we had a session with Pam Wright regarding business lessons from outside of aquatics. Let me put some of these links in the chat box. I have fallen behind on that. And Pam was here from Adobe, the software company. I've known Pam for a number of years, and she was sharing some of her learnings from being in the software industry for a while, but also as an individual who's focused her growth and her development on trying to not get caught up in perfectionism, trying to um, do a good job, but also she talked about the Pareto principle. So 20% of your results will come from 80% of your effort, or 80% of results will come from 20% of effort. So she shared some really good perspective on, um, you know, assessing what's working, moving projects along, having communication about what is reasonable as a deliverable, things like that. So let me put those in the chat box. So yeah, really, really interesting session that we had on Friday. And as always, these recordings will be up on YouTube as soon as we can get them up. So appreciate your patience with that. I really thought that we would have the videos out at a faster clip than we have for this year, but that is, that's just the reality of where things are at with COVID. I'm sure those of you who are here have experienced projects that, you know, despite your best efforts with, with the pandemic, things just don't happen in the timeline that you were hoping for or in the order that you were hoping for. So, yeah, that's so today. Let's talk a little bit about today's session. We're just waiting for our presenter to join us. Today, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Lindsay Blackstock. She is a professor at Thompson Rivers University in British Columbia. I got connected with Dr. Blackstock through some of the literature regarding her research that I first came across in 2017. Her work first went viral. In, and I encountered it uh, in a variety of popular science magazines, as well as some different journals. And just in the pool industry, the pool operation side of things, we were seeing a lot of discussion about what items are not disinfected or not oxidized in pool operations. So let's take a step back for a moment. This is kind of material we talk about in the Certified Pool Operator course, but just because we don't know who has what background. When we add chlorine to the swimming pool, the chlorine is disinfecting the water. That is the basic function of the chlorine. You might have bromine in other markets, you might have other sources of disinfection such as hydrogen peroxide or um, different products. But the chlorine is doing the disinfecting and then it is also doing the oxidation. 
So the process of oxidation is the process of burning off the microscopic structures that may not be visible to the human eye, but that contaminate the water as it is being reused over time. So if we look at my water bottle, it has clear water from the tap. It is safe for me to drink. It has chlorine in it, so it's been disinfected. And it's also been oxidized so that it's clear. It's not brown. It's not gray. It's not cloudy. It is just what it is. And so one of the things that's come up with swimming pools is we're wondering what is happening with things that are not oxidized by chlorine? So bigger objects such as clips, earrings, bobby pins, those are going to be filtered out by um, your swimming pool filter. But what is the process for actually oxidizing artificial contaminants that may end up in the water? Like things that come out of the human body like sweat or urine lotion on the body, makeup, hair gel, all of those things, we know that they can be oxidized by chlorine. But when we start getting into synthetic things such as sweeteners or other additives or components, where, where are they going? Are they able to be fully oxidized? Are they able to be um, disinfected? What does that look like? So, uh, yeah. That's kind of the plan for today. I've just sent a quick note to our presenter. Let's give her a minute or two and see what's happening. I just could be one of those days. There were some time zones at play, so I hope there's nothing, nothing has come up, but I do appreciate your patience. Oh, here, there we go. Let me make a presenter. All right. So I do think, unless we have multiple Lindsay's. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Wonderful. I am so sorry. I totally was mixed up. I thought it was at 3 p.m. I was totally backwards with the timing. <laughs> it's all good. I was just having a moment of, I don't have anything planned to fill air. Oh, my goodness. I am so sorry to everyone. All good. Reading. Five minutes. Apologies. Just please give me one minute to just. I was going to say, let myself. me read the introduction. I'll read my introduction and that'll give you a moment. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I am so sorry, everyone. I'm. No, no. You're good. Totally you're good. Okay. We're a very forgiving audience. It was more because I was saying to everybody who is here, I had made a mistake with the Click meeting registration and Andrea kindly sent me an email this morning saying hey Katie you've been saying it's in the afternoon but the registration link is for the morning so I take full ownership of that no um, no worries yeah and I saw in my calendar it was like like two and a half or like a big huge time block and I'm like hmm, something must be funky here and I like didn't even clue in and then you said I got the re-register email and I was like oh, oh no so apologies everyone that's okay. Let me read your introduction and then we'll let you get started uh, just so people know who you are. I'm, I already gave a little bit of background, but it's always like I'm, we never know what kind of experience level people are coming to this topic. So I gave a little bit of background and there's some great links on the show notes page, everyone. I've pinned those in the chat box. There's some great videos and some kind of really um, simple articles that are based on some of the principles of the research you're going to see today. But essentially, Lindsay Blackstock is an assistant teaching professor at Thompson Rivers University. She currently teaches first year chemistry and is the associated chemistry lab coordinator. Lindsay recently graduated with her PhD from the University of Alberta, specializing in analytical environmental toxicology. Her research focused on investigating relationships between artificial sweeteners and water quality. And I'm thrilled that she's agreed to be here today just as a pool nerd. I think it's so fascinating. We, we were kind of talking a bit on Friday about all the things we could be measuring that exist in water that we don't even currently test for. So it's a whole field, I think, that could involve for future research. Um, so let's say a big thank you and hello to Lindsay in the chat box. And I'm going to disappear off screen as I always do. Feel free to throw your questions out to Dr. Blackstock as she's presenting. She's very comfortable with keeping an eye on the chat box, but we'll also have a Q&A at the end. Awesome. Okay. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I was telling Katie when we were talking last week that I'm just so grateful that this research that I did now 
several years ago is still giving me the opportunity to present and talk about it because I am also a chemistry nerd. So I get really excited to talk about this research because it's so tangible and so relatable and fun for the general public. Um, so again, please feel free to throw any questions in the chat, just as a heads up, as you've probably seen, I do have 48 slides. So at about a minute per slide, if, if we're not chatty in the chat box, we should get through in uh, about 50 minutes. But um, I'll try to be quick and to the point. I can sometimes get excited and be a chatterbox. Okay, a minute to take a breath after that rushed entrance. All right, so today I'm really excited to talk to you all about this novel application of a sweet technique and how I use the artificial sweetener, a sulfame, which its structure is right here in this yellow droplet as an indicator of urine in swimming pools and hot tubs. So you are all familiar with swimming pools and hot tubs. And now we can think about what's this new way that we can identify if there is urine present in these bodies of water. So swimming, this is relevant to the majority of us in North America from Canada's point of view, swimming is the third most practiced sport and that's behind hockey and golf. And it's a really widely recognized cardiovascular activity. It's a good low impact exercise that we want to be promoting. But water quality specifically in swimming pools was is something that is continually brought up in the widespread media. Um, in 2016, it was a cover story in our CNEN news, chemical and engineering news. And if you remember the Rio Olympics, the color of one of the swimming pools, it turned green quite dramatically. And that was the topic of quite a few news articles at that time as well. So why do we need to then monitor human activity in swimming pools? I'm sure you have been through an experience where either as a child, if you were swimming or you've had to deal with it yourself, the fecal contamination, okay? This can cause wide uh, waterborne illness like Giardia, Cryptosporidium. If there's a fecal incident, then everyone has to get out of the pool, shock the pool. I'm sure there are also the protocols, right? For a vomiting incident or other bodily fluids. And they need to be rectified immediately after they're discovered. But what about urine in pools? Peeing in the pool, that can go by unnoticed. It can be something that is not easily monitored. In a US national survey, 19% of adults admitted to peeing in a pool at least one time. And that was a survey of a thousand people. And there has been studies, analytical studies, to monitor and determine the concentration of urea and other urinary markers in swimming pools before. Uh, Chip Blatchley is a researcher in that field out of the US that has done a lot of work in that area. And there has been a estimated urinary contribution of 77.5 milliliters per swimmer. So this is not brand new innovative work to think, okay, do people pee in pools? But what's different here today is how are we going to monitor? How are we gonna find a unique way to identify a, an indicator of urine in pools? But even though in an anonymous survey, people might admit, okay, yeah, I've peed in the pool one time, but in general, peeing in the pool is a taboo. Nobody's going to self-identify and say, oh yeah, like I pee in the pool every Saturday. Like people aren't doing that because it's a taboo, but they might still be peeing in the pool. Why? Because there's this general zeitgeist, right? This general attitude that even those like Michael Phelps pee in the pool, these professional athletes talk about making their mark in the pool. So perhaps the public isn't aware 
that peeing in the public pool is more than just gross. So perhaps we can educate about what are the potential negative impacts of adding additional contaminants into a pool like our bodily fluids, like urine. <clears throat> so because swimming pools are a shared body of water and there's the potential that there can be the transmission of waterborne illness, we need to disinfect our pools. Now here I have an example, chlorine, but chlorine is not our only type of disinfectant, right? You can have brominated disinfectants, you could have oxidation, you could have UV irradiation. There's different strategies in ensuring that you prevent the transmission of these waterborne illnesses. But what is important to note is, while we're not gonna compromise on disinfection, these disinfectants can react with these excess organic materials that are present in our recreational water bodies, in our swimming pools, in our hot tub water. And those organic materials are going to unintentionally react with the disinfectants to form disinfection byproducts. Okay, I saw someone typing there, but again, I'll be watching the chat. You're all good. Excellent. Okay, so DBPs, so how I'm gonna call them for short, these disinfection byproducts. Why do they matter? Like, okay, so our disinfectants might react with some of this organic matter or organic materials in our recreational waters and form DBPs, but who cares? Like it's an just another chemical. But DBPs, they are of human health relevance because in drinking water, okay, that's another type of water where DBPs are formed when we're disinfecting our municipal drinking water. DBPs have been found to be associated, long-term consumption of them through drinking water is associated with an increased potential risk of developing bladder cancer. Okay, so even though this associated risk at a population level is small, it's of real public interest because the majority of us in North America rely on disinfected municipal water for our drinking source. So we want to minimize the potential risk of developing bladder cancer in our widespread population. So Health Canada, the EPA, the WHO, all these different public health agencies, they regulate a subset of specific disinfection byproducts in drinking water and there's maximum levels. Okay, but that's drinking water. What about DBPs in swimming pools and hot tubs? Are there the same risks? What do we know about DBPs in swimming pools and hot tubs? Well, they have also done these large scale population studies or epidemiological studies where they look at, okay, here's a big group of the population, they've been exposed to this thing, so maybe they swim for a particular amount of time per week, and then they're gonna compare it with a whole group of a population where they don't have an exposure to maybe swimming pools. And then they're gonna do a big survey and question them about their health outcomes. And using these comparative studies, they found that swimming pools and hot tubs, when people are, are um, exposed to the DVPs in them, the bladder cancer risk is less consistent. So that's not really the major factor when it comes to DVPs in swimming pools. But what's important to note is that in DVPs, for DVPs in Canada and North America, the concentrations of them are not regulated. So in drinking water, yes, we do have these regulations where all the different uh, utilities have to check their water levels, check the DVP concentrations and make sure the concentration is below a particular level on average, but there's no such guidelines um, in, in a widespread fashion across Canada or North America. But what's important is that in, in swimming pools and hot tubs, the concentrations of DVPs is so much higher than what we see in drinking water. And there's been studies that show that with increased usage, with more swimmers, the concentrations of DBPs increase. 
and hundreds of different of DBPs have been detected in swimming pools and hot tubs. And what's important is when you take some of those extracts, when you take a big sample of our swimming pool or hot tub water, and then you condense it down and you extract it and extract it into a really concentrated sample, they find that those extracts, when you treat cells with them, they're found to cause mutations in those cell lines. They're mutagenic. And they found that the extracts from hot tubs are more mutagenic than swimming pools, and those are all more mutagenic than tap water. So these compounds, these disinfection byproducts that are being formed in swimming pools and hot tubs, they are of some health relevance. While it's not um, bladder cancer, there's something to be aware of. There's also trichloramine, okay? So again, I don't want to anyone after this presentation to be frightened of disinfection, okay? I want to underscore that disinfection is so important to prevent the transmission of waterborne illness, right? Like we wanna be sure that there's not like an acute outbreak of like some E. coli or cryptosporidium, right? Where people are gonna get severe gastrointestinal illness or, right, there can be fatalities as well with these gastrointestinal illnesses and waterborne illness. So I wanna emphasize that disinfection is so important, but there are these unintentional, relatively less intense risks that we still want to be able to mitigate if we can. We can reduce them if we can. So trichloramine is one of these DBPs that is unintentionally formed. Now, everyone here is going to be familiar with trichloramine. Why? Because trichloramine is responsible for that very nostalgic indoor swimming pool smell. When you go to an indoor recreational facility with swimming pools and you get that blast of chlorine, that's really trichloramine. And trichloramine is formed from different nitrogenous precursors. So different molecules that contain nitrogen. And some of the main nitrogenous compounds that are additional precursors into swimming pools and hot tubs is urea. Urea is found in urine. When urea reacts with chlorine, it forms trichloramine. Now trichloramine, it doesn't just have that really pungent aroma. It also has been linked with asthma in professional swimmers and pool workers after chronic exposure. And it's a lung and ocular irritant. So some, and it's population based. Some people are going to be more sensitive to trichloramine than others. But some swimmers might get really red eyes or some swimmers might get like an irritated rash. And these are all things that are related to exposure to trichloramine. And trichloramine is a really widespread, understood, well-recognized DBP in recreational waters. But there's not any particular widespread regulations for trichloramine in Canada and I believe in North America, but there is in Europe. So we're slowly falling behind and Katie was just uh, letting me know that there is slowly becoming more regulations, at least there's some in BC for indoor levels of some DBPs, but we are trailing behind in terms of regulations compared to Europe. So all of this being said, why is it difficult to monitor swimming pool DBPs? Now I'm coming at this sort of general problem about people peeing in pools and it's leading to precursors to DBPs. What's, what's my angle? Well, I, I'm an analytical chemist so I'm wondering, okay, how can we monitor these swimming pool DBPs? There's some challenges involved. Some of the challenges is that there are many DBPs are formed. So it's not just trichloramine. There's, there's hundreds of others that have been detected. And how are we going to sample all of those DBPs? What are we going to sample? Are we going to sample the swimming pool? Or what if some of these DBPs are volatile? Maybe they form gas. Maybe they're like in the air. 
more than in the water. So how are we going to collect those? And how are we going to analyze all of those different sample types? There's a lot of these complexities, logistical issues that happen to come into play when you start to think about your study design for trying to monitor swimming pool DVPs. The other issue is that it's hard to monitor the precursors. So I said there's been studies that look at urea in swimming pools, and we saw that a major precursor to trichloramine is urea, which is in urine. And you think, oh, well, why don't we just scoop up some swimming pool water and we can just look for the amount of urea in the water. But our disinfectants are continuously reacting with our precursors and degrading them. So what we're trying to find in our swimming pool, when we're trying to search for our precursors, they might not be there anymore by the time we're taking our samples. So there's a lot of different challenges involved with how to monitor swimming pool DVPs. So my research, my novel strategy was to come up with a indicator of urine and recreational water. So here is this cute little image of this child in the swimming pool with a big blue cloud because I think there's this urban myth about how when you swim in the pool, if you pee in the pool, there's going to be a cloud of dye. Okay, and this product doesn't exist to my knowledge. No such a a pee dye indicator in swimming pools. And as we talked about, going pee in the pool is, is a, it does for residential pools. Yeah, a gimmick, <laughs> right? But, but on, our, on our scale, um, we don't have this, right? It's going unnoticed. So how could we then look for a way to indicate our urine in our recreational waters. So why is this important? Because if we can identify that people are peeing in the pools because they're not gonna admit it. They're not gonna admit it to themselves, perhaps, they because they think, oh, Michael Phelps does it, or maybe they just think, oh, it's a taboo, I'm not gonna tell anyone. But if we educate them on what's the importance of reducing this additional organic material in swimming pools, then we can reduce the amount of precursors, we can reduce the amount of urea, then that's gonna decrease the amount of our irritating DBPs that are formed like trichloramine. Because as I mentioned, we don't wanna stop chlorinating, we don't wanna stop disinfecting our pools because we need to prevent the transmission of waterborne illness. So a great indicator needs to have three specific qualities. It needs to be representative of urine, so it can't be present in your shampoo and it can't be present in your body lotion. It needs to have a distinct source and it needs to be stable, okay? So let's think about what could be this magical indicator of urine and recreational water. So I went to the literature and I saw that artificial sweeteners had been tagged as like this great indicator of human waste. Why? They are commonly consumed by the general public, right? Population-wide, lots of people are consuming different artificial sweeteners on a daily basis. They are specific to food and pharmaceuticals. There's not artificial sweeteners in like your hair products or your body lotion or in your cosmetics. It's for things that you consume. They're non-nutritive and not metabolized in humans. Now this is important because that means that you're going to have the same molecular structure of that sweetener when someone is eating it and it's going to be excreted in the same form. So it's not metabolized. It doesn't change its molecular structure. And it's stable. It does not cause any calorie absorption because it's not being broken down. So it's good for the general public in terms of weight management and also good for diabetics because it doesn't affect blood sugar. 
artificial sweeteners are rapidly absorbed and excreted unchanged. So uh, a person who eats artificial sweeteners, they're going to excrete that in the next like 24 to 48 hours at the most. So it is going to come out in a concentrated form. Now, as I mentioned, they're super stable and they're present in processed foods that have a really long shelf life. So that gives the possibility that a, so, uh, different artificial sweeteners might be present in swimming pools and hot tubs. Now, as I said, I saw this in the literature when I was looking up and trying to identify an indicator of urine, of human waste. And I saw that artificial sweeteners, they had been found in different environmental water sources and they've been studied globally. So all around the world, there's been reports of artificial sweeteners being detected. They've been labeled as emerging environmental contaminants because they're not significantly broken down by wastewater treatment plants. So the general public is consuming them and consuming them and excreting them out unchanged. And if they're going through the wastewater treatment plant and being right released into the receiving water body, they're going to start to show up in those surface and ground waters around the world. Now, because of these specific characteristics, the fact that it's so stable, the fact that it's very specific, like they're specific to um, a human population, right? Because they're in food and pharmaceuticals. They've been used successfully to indicate human waste impact in different environmental waters. So surface waters and groundwaters, but the strategy of using artificial sweeteners as indicators of human waste in swimming pools had never been done before. So it had been done in tap water, in river water, groundwater, lake water, but never before in swimming pools and hot tubs. So this wasn't a brand new idea. And also not only artificial sweeteners have been used, there's also, you can look at different pharmaceuticals as tracers for human impact. There's all sorts of different ways we can trace the impact of humans in the environment. So let's take a look at asulfame. So I specifically focused on asulfame, which is a particular artificial sweetener because of its excretion in the human body. It's excreted greater than 99%, so almost completely in urine. Now, this makes a sulfame a much better indicator for urine than some other artificial sweeteners like sucralose. Maybe you've heard of sucralose. Sucralose is excreted about 85% in feces. So that's not going to be a really helpful indicator for us when we're trying to focus on swimming pools because we all know that feces in the swimming pool is going to be detected right away and removed and remediated. So I chose to look at esulfame specifically. It was also highly stable across a range of temperatures and pH, and I knew that because it was used in cooking. And environmentally, as I mentioned, these artificial sweeteners have been identified as emerging environmental contaminants. So I've seen that it had been resisting decomposition by wastewater treatment plants, UV irradiation, and different microbes in soil. So if it was in a swimming pool, it has a chance of being present when I'm trying to detect it. So as I mentioned, asulfame specifically had been found to be an effective indicator of human waste impact in environmental water bodies, but the concept had not yet been applied to recreational water bodies. So my research question was, can we use ACE, asulfame, as an indicator of urine in swimming pools and hot tubs? In order to answer this question, I had to identify and answer two smaller questions. The first was, could I even identify or measure a sulfame in swimming pools and hot tubs? I needed to determine the occurrence of it. If it's not detectable in these 
different water types, swimming pools and hot tubs, it's not gonna be a good indicator. If I could detect it, then I move to step two. Using the concentration of a sulfame that I detected, can I estimate the volume of urine in those water bodies? And that, if I could show that, number two, that would illustrate a sulfame is a feasible indicator of urine. So how was I going to detect a sulfame in the swimming pool and hot tub samples? I came up with a, a method, a new method. And because I'm a chemistry nerd, I'm going to kind of give you the foundational understanding of how I was able to identify and measure my asulfame in my samples. So I used a set of instruments. Now, if you write this down and tell your friends, you'll sound super nerdy, like you might sound, um, like someone from Bones or, right, like use this really fancy long-winded lingo, high-performance liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry, okay? So uh, that not that a drag? But let's get into the general concept of how this works to look for our asulfame molecule. So for the HPLC, this high-performance liquid chromatography, What's the key thing for this method is that our sample is in a liquid sample. It's in the water sample that we collected it. And we inject this water sample through a column. And these little shapes, these triangles and circles and squares in the column, they represent different molecular compounds. So different compounds in the sample, one of it could be a sulfame. So essentially, this column is made up of a particular substance, and the amount that our compounds are attracted to that substance, if it's really attracted to the column, it's going to slow down their movement through the column. And if those molecules aren't really attracted to that column, they're going to shoot through the column really fast, and it's going to separate, this separates out the different molecular species in the sample. Once we have those molecular species separated, they get injected into a mass spectrometer. Now here's coming back, depending on your background, maybe to high school science uh, in chemistry, we have our periodic table here. And you might remember that each of our different atoms of different elements have a different mass. So our mass spectrometer is like a big filter and it filters through and looks for compounds of a very, very specific mass. So once we have then separated the compounds in our sample, they go through our mass spectrometer where essentially they get blown apart. So in each section of this mass spectrometer, it's going to filter for one mass. So in this case, it's filtering for the specific mass of this purple molecule. It just lets through the purple molecule and it goes through a collision cell where it's going to get exploded by an electron beam. So the electron beam explodes these molecules into very characteristic and reproducible individual puzzle pieces that all, all of those fragments, all of those puzzle pieces that make up that original compound have a specific mass. And because we are able to detect so specifically those masses, we can then look for the specific masses of the puzzle piece and the original molecule to detect the compound, okay? So that's as crazy as I'm gonna get science-wise, but I just think learning how detection methods work is so interesting. So here I just have an example of some of the signals for my asulfame molecule at different really low concentrations. So here on the far right hand side, that's one nanogram per liter. So that's detecting one molecule in a pool of a trillion. So it's one part per trillion. So that is how sensitive 
I was able to get this method to detect a sulfame and the lowest reproducible detection I had was 0 0.5 nanograms per liter. So that's one molecule in every two trillion molecules. So really, really sensitive using this um, technology. So now that I had this method, I validated it and um, found that it was ready to study my samples. I had collected samples from different swimming pools and hot tubs in both BC and Alberta. Okay, so how, what was I gonna do with those samples? I collected three samples, triplicate, in every single site. So we had three samples. All I had to do, so this is a very low, low difficulty method. So you can think of, you can imagine when you're doing different chemical analysis, sometimes you have to do a lot of prep work into your samples. This one was really simple. All you had to do was filter it to make sure there was no like particulates in the water sample that would plug up my instruments. And then I actually diluted my samples 20 times because my method was so sensitive, I found that I didn't need that sensitive of a method to detect the asulfame. That is a little bit of a spoiler, okay? I had to dilute my samples to detect the asulfame. And then as an extra check, I added in a spike of a deuterated internal standard. So this deuterated internal standard, basically it has the exact same molecular structure as a sulfame. Oh, I realized my pointer wasn't showing. It has the exact same uh, structure as a sulfame, but it has deuterium instead of hydrogen attached. Now this is again, super nerdy, but because deuterium is a heavy hydrogen molecule, this internal standard is going to behave exactly the same as our compound of interest, but it has a slightly different mass. So we can ensure that the detection we're doing is very, very accurate when we add this in. Then I run it through my method, which you all know how it works now because you all understand this super interesting chemistry. So then I was able to then ask the question, is a sulfame present in recreational waters? This was question number one. So I was able to implement then my experimental design. I collected samples from two cities in Alberta and BC and I had 16 total collection sites. There was 12 recreational facilities, three hotels and one private facility. That was a, um, it was a large apartment building. So between those 16 sites, we had 21 swimming pools and eight hot tubs. And what's important is I also collected the input tap water because these different recreational water bodies, these swimming pools and hot tubs, they were being refilled, maintaining their water level with the same municipal tap water source. So I collected the, a sample of each of the tap water as a control because I needed to make sure maybe there was already some of our artificial sweetener asulfame in the tap water. Okay, so keep that in mind. So I took those samples and I analyzed them to look for our artificial sweetener asulfame. Now, what did I find? Now, take a minute, we'll orient ourselves to this data. I know that this is a lot on the screen at once, but what we see here, we have four different figures. On the left-hand side with the orange bars, we have the tap water control samples, okay? So there was eight sites in British Columbia. We have the British Columbia samples on the top of the screen, and we have the Alberta samples on the bottom half of the screen, okay? so. Each of these orange bars represents one of the facilities that we collected our samples. So here we have our tap water samples. What was the concentration of our asulfame? The concentration of asulfame ranged between six to 15 nanograms per liter, okay? six to 15 nanograms per liter. Let's compare it to the swimming pools and hot tubs. 
what did we find for asulfame? First, we found asulfame in every single sample, every hot tub and every swimming pool. Our swimming pools have blue bars and our hot tubs are the purple bars. Now we can see that the concentrations were much greater than what were in our control samples. The concentrations ranged from 30 in swimming pool 10 all the way to 7,000, over 7,000 nanograms per liter in this hot tub number five. Now, you can see that the concentrations in our swimming pools and hot tubs were dramatically greater. They range from four times as much as our control samples all the way up to over 500 times concentrated. Now, because you're all familiar with swimming pools and hot tubs, I wanna also mention a really subtle sort of pattern that I found in the data that um, I didn't elaborate too much on because we had limited information at each of the collection sites, so it was difficult to tease out any really concrete trends. But you can see here that our hot tub samples the purple bars, they were either really, really large, really high concentration of asulfame, so over 2,000 nanograms per liter or less than 100, 100 here, 80, 70, and 70. Whereas our swimming pool samples, they kind of had a more um, consistent range, whereas our hot tub samples were kind of like either really low or really high concentration. And I think, that that is due to the maintenance schedules of hot tubs compared to swimming pools because the I only collected samples on one day. So that only was a snapshot in time of the situation with a solfame. With hot tubs, they can be completely drained and refilled on a more regular basis because they're a smaller volume of water. Also, because they are a smaller volume of water, you can imagine that one person's volume of their bladder, one urinary event is gonna make a much larger impact on the concentration of the asulfame that you observe. So I thought that was uh, something that was kind of interesting and I would want to look into more if I continued this study. I think I would focus on hot tubs because you see that concentration change a lot faster. So to summarize this part one, we found ACE was present in 100% of the pools, four to 570 times greater than the input tap water. But because we had limited information on our collection sites, I didn't know the volumes of all the swimming pools. I didn't know how frequently they were being used or how often they were being filled. It was really difficult to identify any conclusions about that data aside from that a sulfame was present at every site at elevated concentrations. And because we knew that a sulfame is not present in our personal care products, it must be a source from urine. Okay. So our next objective was to estimate the urine content in swimming pools using the determined asulfame concentration. So I wanted to illustrate the feasibility of using asulfame as an indicator. So I focused on two specific swimming pools that had two different sizes. So I called them swimming pool X, here I have labeled in red, and swimming pool Z in green. And swimming pool X and Z X had approximately 420,000 liters. Swimming pool Z was about twice that size. And we collected six samples a day for 15 days over three weeks. And we determined the asulfame concentration in all of those samples. But again, I wanna note that these are not closed systems. These are real swimming pools where we didn't monitor the usage. We didn't have someone counting every single swimmer. We did not have a closed system when it came to um, evaporation and the amount being filled and it wasn't controlled. So all we could do was observe what was happening at these snapshots in time and try to identify what's going on. 
So here we have the resulting data from that three week study. And in blue, we have the tap water control samples. The average asulfame in the tap water over those 15 days was 16 nanograms per liter. So that's in agreement with what we saw in our other tap water samples. And that really agrees and is even lower than what is reported in tap water across other nations around the world. But for our two swimming pools, we can see again in the red and in the green, the concentration of our isulfame is much greater, significantly elevated compared to what's in the tap water. Over the three weeks, we saw the average of swimming pool X as 156 nanograms per liter and swimming pool Z at 210. And again, because it's not a closed system, it's difficult to, um, detangle what this data really means. But what we can see is that there's low variation. So the variability across the entire range of data was less than 20% for both swimming pools. But could we answer our second objective, which is what volume of urine could account for the concentration of asulfame observed? Well, I looked in the research and you would think that there would be some literature about, okay, what's the average artificial sweetener concentration in urine? No, there was nothing, like I couldn't believe it. We know that people are consuming artificial sweeteners all the time, but there was no real uh, studies available on like the Canadian demographic, even North American demographic of people that are consuming artificial sweeteners. I found one study and it was out of China that gave the average concentration of asulfame in urine. And I luckily had a pilot project archive studies and they were from like, so like earlier in the 2000s. And here Katie just put different food products have different quantities of sweetener too. Exactly. So I, I was just thinking like, how am I going to possibly relate what's the average amount of artificial sweeteners because our population is diverse we we do consume artificial sweeteners on a wide scale but it really depends on the people that are using the swimming pool but we needed a starting point just even to do this um, feasibility study and the one uh, report out of china had um, the concentration of a sulfame in urine similar to what i found so i luckily had access to 20 different Canadian urine samples from a pilot project about something completely different. It was a study on arsenic. Um, but I had these archive samples, so I defrosted them and I mixed them all together to get the average sample, to get a picture of these average 20 Canadians. And I analyzed this sample with my method and found the concentration of asulfame in urine to be two million three hundred and sixty thousand nanograms per liter. Now I've kept it in the same units just so we can compare how much the urine could have been diluted, right? To still be present in our swimming pools. So in our swimming pools, we're detecting like a hundred nanograms per liter, whereas it's much, much more concentrated in urine that is a really helpful aspect when it comes to an indicator. You want your indicator compound to be really highly concentrated in your source so that it's more likely to be detected in your sample. So using this piece of information, I was able to do a very simple math calculation. Now it's I, I think back on it and I think it's really a fun exercise that the majority of my PhD, a large portion of my PhD hinged on this calculation, C1V1 equals C2V2. And basically what it does is it's a dilution calculation. So this is a relationship that helps us calculate what was the concentration in a sample before or after we've diluted it. And what we know based on our experimental data is that the concentration in our swimming pool X of asulfame was 156 nanograms per liter. And we knew the approximate volume, 420,000 liters. And we knew our concentration 
of a sulfame in urine, our average that we detected, but we didn't know what volume of urine do we need to add to the pool to account for this concentration of a sulfame that we detected. So when we plugged in our data into this calculation, we were able to estimate the approximate volume of urine to account for the concentration of our sweetener, a sulfame, in each of those two pools. So we estimated 30 liters of urine at that average asulfame concentration would need to be added to the pool to account for that asulfame concentration we detected over the three weeks and 75 liters in that second pool. So once we had completed this story, we had uh, answered our two original questions, we wrote this up and published it in environmental science and technology letters. Now, what was a major shock to me and my supervisor, Xing Fong at the University of Alberta, was the immense interest in our research once we published it. So you can see here, there's been over 22,000 full text downloads of this paper. And I'll just let you know from my experience, like when you publish a paper, you don't get 20,000 people reading it. That is just totally out of this world. That is so many people reading something that you've done. It was so crazy. And the reason it had all of this attention was because it went viral in the media. So it started with local attention and I was, um, I, Global News came into our lab and did an interview and that quickly spread. It was national headlines, international, and it was circulating around the globe. So it was such a really fun experience to go through as a student who normally would have never imagined doing something like that type of media coverage. In fact, after that story was released, I took off uh, two or three weeks from my PhD program just to do interviews for three weeks straight. So it was such a crazy experience. In the first 24 hours, it was covered by 100 different news stories. And uh, like it said here, in the first week, I was I did over 30 interviews and I did uh, radio, live radio, phone interviews, uh, TV interviews, podcasts. It was the craziest experience ever. And I always thank my supervisor for just continuing to push me on this project because I kept saying, but we all know that people pee in pools. Like, who is going to care? But it turns out the world really cares about peeing in pools. But the downside, of course, with every good thing, there is a bad thing that comes along with it or a challenge. The challenge was that there was negative interpretations with the research. So many headlines just wanted clickability. They emphasized the fear. They said, oh, this is gross. Your worst fears of pee and pools have been confirmed by a gross University of Alberta study. So what we did was, we, that's the last thing we wanted to do was scare people away from swimming. So we wrote another publication that same week. Okay, so 12 days later, we published another paper to address all of these media misconceptions because the issue with media is once you give your interview, they don't come back and ask for like a follow-up usually. It's just however that media correspondent has interpreted your story and then they just run with it and it, whatever gets published is published. So we addressed media misconceptions, public concern. We highlighted the limitations of our estimate, which I'll talk about on the next slide. And we wanted to really communicate the accurate risk of these DVPs. So again, the major misconceptions that we found was difficult for the media and general public to really get grasped with 
was that we never directly measured the urine. We used our asulfim concentration to estimate the volume of urine. It was a proof of concept calculation supporting our asulfame as a urine indicator in pools. The average pool has 75 liters of urine. That was a common headline, but it's just not true because every pool is different. We just studied two specific pools. And third, swimming is not gross. We had, there was this big misconception that, oh, this is like dumping 75 liters of urine on your head. Like, no, it's not. It's, as we mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, a lot of these compounds have been degraded by our disinfectants. The disinfectants are doing their job. It's just that we need to be cognizant of the formation of potential DVPs and how can we reduce that. Now, another major limitation is the calculation only considered three variables. So our composite urine sample, that might not have represented a true Canadian average. And more specifically, the average of a sulfame of the people who were really using the swimming pools when we were sampling. And also the volume of swimming pools was just approximate. So if you see here, my little cartoon was from a beautiful mind. This is a mathematician, right? A brilliant mathematician. And here I just use this very simple calculation just with three different variables, two of which were uncertain. So we can't put too much credibility in these estimated values. But I do want to note that it gave an opportunity to really reach my audience. And I had this really great opportunity to collaborate with Mark Rober, who is a popular science educator on YouTube. And we collaborated together to film this video, how to measure how much pee is in your pool. And it's a 10 minute video if ever you're interested. And we really talk about this study in detail and really emphasize that swimming is a really great activity. We just need to stop peeing in the pools when we go swimming. So this has got over 27 million views. So it was a great opportunity to try to correct some of the misinformation that came out with these different media articles. And so why did I talk to, oh, thanks Katie, that's excellent. Yeah, it's, it's a cool little video. It's something that I'm, I was so proud to be able to collaborate with. But I guess some people might ask like, why would you work with the media at all, right? Like, what's the point it was i had to take three weeks off work like it was it was stressful but it was great in hindsight and exciting but doing um research especially publicly funded i was really grateful to be funded by ncerc during my phd which is um, a canadian public fund for research the public wants to know what we're doing if we're using public money to do research we want to then be able to communicate what our results of that research are back to the public but media sometimes is under the crunch. They're often assigned stories that morning and oftentimes their stories are due that same day. So while I had spent years learning about my topic, these journalists were expected to summarize my research in just a single day. So it's no wonder that sometimes things get a little bit blurry when they're writing their stories. Um, if you're curious, in an interview, you would get five to 10 minutes to do your entire interview. If you were live on the radio, you might only get a 30 second clip. So here, I've talked to you for an hour at a motoring pace and I'm still so excited to talk to you about this research. So you can imagine the challenge of trying to summarize this down into 30 seconds or two minutes. So it's really important to be able to tell a simple story and really emphasize the main messages and it comes at your own risk. You don't approve the stories, you just accept the interview and hope that you've communicated your point really effectively. So overall in this study, I was able to develop a new method for a sulfame detection. I detected a sulfame in 100% of the swimming pools and hot tub surveyed. That was the first time ever that anyone had decided, oh, maybe there's artificial sweeteners in these swimming pools and hot tubs. It had never been reported before. And it was the first time we then were able to do a pilot study on two swimming pools where we looked at the concentration over three weeks and then did that basic calculation, the C1V1 equals C2V2, 
to estimate the volume of urine required to account for the asulfame. So this was the first time to apply the strategy of using a sulfame indicator of urine in swimming pools and hot tubs. So it was a really exciting thing to work on and be a part of, especially because it had such great reception from the general public. And this viral media coverage was actually a really interesting and unexpected way to truly make a bit of a difference if maybe that's tooting my own horn too much, but just educating the public on peeing in pools and the importance that we need to reduce the amount of organics that are introduced into pools and to ensure that we're being considerate of our swimmer hygiene, which was another big talking point in the interviews. So making sure we're not peeing in the pools and making sure we're showering and rinsing off before we jump in the pools because while urine is a precursor of DVPs, so are swimming, uh, so are sunscreens and body lotions and shampoos and conditioners. But what's important as the most highest thing to emphasize was the public health message that the benefits of swimming by maintaining a healthy lifestyle and exercising and that cardiovascular benefit far outweigh any of the potential risks from disinfection byproduct exposure. This is an unintended consequence of disinfection, but it is something with such a relatively minor risk that we need to keep that in perspective. And there's a very easy solution to that problem is that we just use the bathroom before we jump in the pool and just keep swimming as Dory said. So with that, I want to thank the research group that I was a part of, Dr. Xingfeng Li, she's at the University of Alberta. I did my PhD with her. I just graduated last September. She is a Canada Research Chair in the Division of Analytical and Environmental Toxicology at the U of A. And with that, oh, I was just at an hour, my goodness. Um, I want to thank you all. Again, apologize for being five minutes late and take any questions you have. I know I just like zoomed through that presentation. It's all good. We have those days. And no, I, I, you're here. That's all that matters. And I so appreciate everything you've presented. It's a little bit more technical than we're used to getting, but I do appreciate. Sorry. No, no. But I was going to say, I do appreciate the process, even as someone who's not, I wouldn't consider myself super scientific, trying to understand the methodology, I think is so helpful because even as a lay person, I was able to think to myself, one of the comments I had as I was, as you were presenting was, how do we even know how much sweetener is in products and what products? And if somebody is consuming, um, let's say pop or soda, if somebody mm -hmm. consumes two liters a day, is their urine a higher concentration totally. of traces? Yes. Than maybe I had one diet brownie, right? Like how do we, yeah. And urine is different in each person, mm -hmm. right? Like how much they, you know, are they dehydrated? Do they drink? Exactly. Do they, like it's so it's there's so much room for further exploration probably and that's why i think getting a real good picture of the average in a population is so important because you're right and what's interesting and i didn't get into it in this presentation is the averages that i estimated 75 liters that's an underestimate mm -hmm. so we have to assume that there's people that are swimming that don't empty their bladder when they're swimming right? Mm -hmm. And some that, that do empty their bladder, they haven't consumed exactly as you said, they've not consumed any artificial sweetener. So they're like a secret, invisible peer, a pee offender, yeah. right? So we haven't caught them. And when we compare our data to previous work that's really looked at urea in swimming pools, we think that that's a bit of an underestimate. It's in the same ballpark, but an underestimate. And I think getting that average concentration would really help narrow in on the accuracy of those estimates. Well, and my understanding too, is I've heard of them measuring like uh, trace medicines that are not fully dissolved by the human body. Mm -hmm. and, and in theory, you could create a whole panel, I'm assuming of let's do some sweeteners, let's do some medicine, yes. let's do some other, I don't know what other artificial things we consume, like artificial proteins or artificial, I don't know, like everything in the grocery store now in packaged foods has some level of, I think, synthetic production in a lab. Yes, 
And there's even those little micro beads that are in cosmetics, like the that are the exfoliants, those are being used, or x-ray contrast media, which is used at hospitals. It's a specific mm -hmm. indicator that like uh, the iodine, right, can be used. So there's all sorts of very specific compounds that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. We don't always think about how are we disposing of them what is the route that they take in the environment after we've disposed of them? And then that can then give us information mm -hmm. of where they came from. Well, and one of the points I was mentioning in the pre-show, for those of you who maybe haven't taken a certified pool operator course, is there's a general misunderstanding about the role of what happens in a pool. So the chlorine is disinfecting the pool water. So it's safe for people to swim in and accidentally drink. And then the filter is removing the physical contaminants such as hairballs and band-aids and, you know, bobby pins. And, and then the oxidation is happening at a microscopic level, but we don't, we don't know in any pool or in every pool, what level of oxidation is really happening. We just see clear water and we think, well, there's nothing there, but at a microscopic level, you know, tiny, tiny molecular micron level, there's stuff there for years until that water is dumped. We just don't measure it. We don't quantify it. There's no standards, like you said, for what's an acceptable level. The only time most lifeguards or pool managers start to see it is really when we talk about turbidity, which is the clarity or quality of the water. And that's measured by passing a sensor through the water. And as it gets more turbid, we know that there's stuff suspended in solution, but until that point, who even knows, right? Yeah, unless there is, like, there could be an issue with, like, rashes, perhaps, could be another indicator of things happening. So there's, but other than that, like, unless there is, like, some really obvious change that you is visible, or you it's, like, um, you can smell it, olfactory, unless you're doing like frequent panels on your swimming pool, like how are you gonna detect it? Well, and like you said too, so there's the human aspect. So one person, let's say an incontinent senior, they accidentally have some pee in the pool. We know that happens at some level, we can't yeah. trace it. Versus an athlete perhaps who's had, you know, two liters before practice and then they don't wanna get out and finish their workout. They pee, you know, again, the quantities are gonna range by person. But then on top of that, it's also from a pool operator side, certain provinces require dilution of the pool. So a province like Ontario, their health regulations require 15 liters of fresh water per person per day. So that's going to impede your measurements versus mm -hmm. other provinces that may not follow that or operationally they, be, they may be more conservative in terms of what splashes out and what evaporates. So it would you, it would be interesting to do other research based on either yeah population, uh, facility usage trends. Is it seniors? Is it kids? But then also I don't know how you could do this without you'd have to be voluntary. But what do people's diets look like? Like I don't exactly. know. Did you get it? Like how did you pick this sweetener versus I think of like stevia or Splenda or which one is this? Yeah. So this one is like um, uh, so let's see. There's like sucralose, which is the other really common one. But sucralose, as I mentioned, so there's four sort of main um, non-nutritive artificial sweeteners. So these are not sugar alcohol. So like stevia um, it, and is a sugar alcohol. So that is one that it actually is going to degrade. You metabolize it and you don't pee it out the same. So I was focused first on ones that are not metabolized. So that's a sulfame, sucralose, and then there's cyclamate and saccharin. So those are the four that are really commonly used as the pillars for indicators in literature around like the world. But depending on the different countries that you're in, there's different regulations on which sweeteners are allowed in your food products. So based in Canada, there is really narrowed us down to sucralose and a sulfame, which are commonly used. But as I mentioned, sucralose is 85% excreted in feces. So that's not going to, when somebody empties their bladder, only 15% of what they had consumed is in their urine. So that's not going to make a big impact in the concentration we observe in the swimming pool. So that's why I chose a sulfame because it's 100% in urine. 
that makes sense because it would be very difficult then to project based on like pee volume from a person and then trying to track back on consumption how much actually is left over if you didn't have that 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 quantity do you have a sense from just your work as you were doing this research like what foods were the is the sweetener present in is it everything or were there specific it, types of products it was present in so many things so it's in a lots of like baked food products so like prepackaged cakes prepackaged puddings or cookies or pastry items it's in a lot of different condiments um yeah like salad dressings it's in some pharmaceuticals so it is in like different flavored like chewable tablets sometimes it is in like all sorts of different products. So, so that's the thing, it's really pervasive in the foods that we eat and drink as well. It's in lots of beverages too. But yeah, we didn't do any surveys for people using the pool because as soon as you start adding those layers, like the projects become like so big very quickly. And it ends up being like quite challenging to tackle by yourself or even with a team with a summer student or something. And I was thinking too, you know, in terms of layers of, you know, I'm sure you could work on this forever, but even the pool size, when you mentioned the two pool sizes, one was about 480,000 liters, one was in 800,000 ish. Those are still relatively big pools. So whether making a smaller pool would make it easier or harder. So let's say a residential family pool you know, in a, in a weird circumstance, would it be helpful to track one family and one family's diet, one family's usage and somehow prorate that or correspond it? Whereas a bigger pool in a bigger community, you don't know if you've got regular people coming multiple days, all different people. This is all pre-COVID, obviously. Like mm -hmm. it would be very difficult to track what percentage is high performance athletes that are swimming a disproportionate amount of time versus casual swimmers only coming in for a little bit and still a huge water volume over 15 days in a, is it summer, really busy? Is it Christmas, not really busy? Like there's so many outlying factors. And the other important factor too is because when I was sampling the different facilities, like when you're in that state of you need to get collect samples, you, you don't always have the luxury of like really orchestrating like a fantastic package of places to sample. So I was kind of sampling everything. So I had indoor pools, outdoor pools, leisure pools, diving pools, and I wasn't really able to tease out any particular trends between those types of facilities. But again, I only had 16 facilities. It's really hard to make these types of um, conclusions about these things, but also outdoor pools, while you have to also consider you're gonna have um, the UV. So asulfame is resistant to UV, but it can still degrade with UV. So the sun is actually helping to mm -hmm. break down a lot of the compounds that are in the swimming pool as well when you have an outdoor facility. And then uh, the other important thing to note, um, oh wait, am I, I think I'm getting, I think I'm losing my train of thought. I just lost my train of thought on the second part to note. But anyways, um, yeah, there's, there's so many things to consider when you are like sort of creating these research questions and trying to logistically get all your samples together. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, and I think that's where, from my perspective, I'm not trying to throw rocks. I think the research is amazing, but I'm just also thinking like, what other interference would there be oh. from other substances added to mm -hmm. the pool? Like if it's a, um, like what we what we'll call like a salt water pool where the chlorine is yes. generated through a salt system versus a, you know, like you said, a bromine pool or chlorine pool that's using sodium hypochlorite versus calcium. How do those molecules bond differently? Like I think there's, there's so much you could restrict, but then also so many then little projects you'd have to do. And I was actually, I remembered my other thought. I think that because you were talking about some different ways that you could sort of craft the study design to control some things. I think what I would do if I were able to work on this study again is it, I think the best situation would be to have like an indoor um, hot tub or spa facility where I'd be a lot more thoughtful about it. So I would want to collect alongside like two maintenance schedules. So if they like did like every two weeks, let's say a total dump and refill to collect along that period to monitor the users, 
then we could also, in our sample, we could also look for some key DVP. So we could, we could collect the air sample and look for trichloramine and see, is there a correlated concentration as we move through this maintenance schedule? Does it correlate with the sulfame? And because it's a smaller volume of liquid in a hot tub, then it'd be much more concentrated um, a sulfame, so you'd be able to see that impact of a urinary event uh, in a greater fashion. Well, and I wonder too, did you ever test just the source water, the tap water? Is there is there presence in regular tap water, like my drinking yes. water? Yes, there is. And um, I, it, like I just breezed through it in a flash, but in the tap waters, the concentration was less than like 15 nanograms per liter. So mm -hmm. it was less than half of the concentration that was in the lowest concentration swimming pool. So definitely there had to be something else being added to the swimming pool to account for that significant difference. But again, it's, it was difficult to say because we just had that snapshot in time, just that one sample, and, and we didn't have a lot of information. Well, and I know too, I haven't done a lot of work with water treatment operators, but the few conversation and conversations I have had is that water treatment standards are very different across Canada and different cities or municipalities will set very different standards even in the same region for what they will tolerate whether it's DBPs disinfection byproducts like you mentioned or minimum chlorine standards so I would imagine there too it, it would become it would further complicate the matter but talking with water operators what are they doing seasonally like winter treatment versus spring treatment how they they grab the makeup of the area so where I am outside Calgary, it comes from the Bow River as well as the reservoir. It's a mix as well as, you know, mountain runoff, but it's different everywhere, right? Like it's it's kind of an endless rabbit trail if you wanted it to be this research. And the other really important factor is the infrastructure, which is available to, depending on whatever you're thinking about, if you're thinking about water treatment, what is the infrastructure available to that municipality? What kind of technology does the utility use to accomplish the same goal in getting safe drinking water for our swimming pools? What kind of technology and infrastructure is available to ensure that that water quality is maintained and the strategies that you're going to apply to overcome challenges in each different facility are going to be completely different based on the different technologies that you're using at each center. Mm -hmm. I want to do a last call for questions in the chat box because if anybody does have any questions, we want to make sure we get to those. Give people a moment to type if there's anything. Um, I wanted to ask further about your experience. So you, I love that you shared your media experience, how your research went viral. Um, what kind of support or opinions were there in the university when this happened? Because my experience with academia is they're not always keen to try and, you know, drill down years of research into a soundbite, right? It's sometimes a little bit begrudging. It was really challenging. I was really lucky that my supervisor, Shing Fong, she was really willing to let me run with it. So she like, I'm sure there's I'm sure there's experiences where there's a student and their supervisor and the supervisor just like steps in and like, here I am. Here's my research when really it was that lowly student just slaving away. So I was very grateful that Shing Fong kind of let me like have the whole spotlight, if you will. Like <laughs> it was a very stressful experience, but um, most institutions. So the U of A, they have like a specific media team. They have a media consultant. Um, so uh, I had already in my graduate program, we had like a specific class with this media consultant. So I'd met them before. They kind of explained what happens if your research ever is interviewed in the media, but it's, it was never at a scale that I had <laughs> ever expected. I felt like, oh, maybe you might get like one interview one time or two. But yeah, this, this is a dramatic scale. So I had some coaching with... Um, our university representative, but also like the publishing house, um, ACS, American Chemical Society, they had thought that the, based on the nature and the content of the research, they thought that it would go uh, quite sensationalized. So when we had published it and it got accepted, they said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to publish it with an embargo. So we wrote up a press release ahead of time, just kind of giving like the Coles notes of 
what our research was and what we had found. And that went out, I think like three days ahead of when it was actually published to the general public. So we started getting interviews um, as soon as it was released to the media with the with the press release and then so i got i don't know like maybe like six or eight interviews and then when it actually went live on like march 1st then it was like insanity i remember like being on like the the public transit to university and i kept like refreshing google and there'd be like another page on google and another page on google and then it was just like people phoning me, people messaging me on Facebook, like hundreds of messages, emailing me, like my phone would ring nonstop. I did interviews through the middle of the night live with like the BBC. And it was like the such a whirlwind experience. It was very, very, very weird. But I feel like it was it was neat. And I I'm happy I did it. But it, I would be nervous if I had to do it again. <laughs> Well, I think it's so interesting. I think you, we could have a whole conversation about social media in general and the way, I mean, I have a master's degree and I declined going on to a PhD because part of it for me was the relevancy of the work that we do. And I think mm -hmm. it's so interesting to see that, you know, work that you were passionate about uh, that, you know, yes, there is the downside, like you said, the media using scare tactics, clickbait and saying, you know, this is making pools dangerous and and that's not the point, and that's not what you were, you know, that's not the point of your research, nor are those the conclusions if people read the actual research. Right. But that <laughs> marketing people are, are they're looking for clicks, they're looking for page views, they're looking for reshares, but still to have that relevancy in 2021 in academia and say, you know, I've published research and it has had wide appeal, and that's very appealing to universities. And like, I loved your tie into accountability as a scholar who was publicly funded that like making this accessible to regular people in a way that they might find perhaps more meaningful than research that's very granular and hard to digest. Yeah, I was uh, really lucky. I will give one final shout out to my PhD supervisor, Shing Fong. She always, 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 it doesn't matter what you're working on, you have to make her care about it. She will stop you in any presentation. She'll say, who cares? Why do you care? You better relate it yeah. to something that someone cares about. And you always can. There's always a way to take your research and relate it to something someone cares about. But if you don't have the ability to put on the those glasses, because you know why you care about it, if it's your research, you're like, oh, of course this is important. But if you, you can't distill that down into why someone else should care about it, then it's not gonna be likely you're gonna get funding and have like a successful research team. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a, just a way to market yourself and your ideas. Yes. No, that and then what? Where does it go from there? It doesn't just sit on a shelf, I think, is that legacy piece that, in my experience anyway, in the, my fields of study, it's something that was missing in terms of relevancy and, and, and longevity. Um, my last question for Dr. Blockstock before we go, where did you get this idea? How did this whole project start? That's kind of what I want to know. Yeah, so um, my supervisor, Shing Fong, so she, her specialty is um, like drinking water, uh, specifically disinfection byproducts. She has done, excuse me, also some work on like culturable but non-viable E. coli, so different aspects of water quality. So in like the uh, disinfection byproduct field, there's always like hot topics that come up and we're always monitoring like what are the hot topics, what's emerging environmental contaminants. As I mentioned, artificial sweeteners were one. And we have lots of collaborations or I, I'm, I graduated from the group. So she has lots of collaborations with different water researchers and they were specifically at first looking at wells. So they were doing well water, looking for these artificial sweeteners and they had started to work on a method for a sulfame and sucralose and then she said to me she's like okay like let's just sample something else so she said sample some swimming pools but we didn't tie together the idea that oh why do we care about swimming pools the fact that the trichloramine and the irritating dvps i was i was so proud of myself because i kept saying like why do we care like we all know people pee in pools. There has to be a better reason why people care. And that is the reason. I think it's so important 
once we educate that there is a downside, you can really be a better neighbor to your swimmer at a public pool if you just refrain from peeing in the pool. And if you just rinse off ahead of time, I think it's really important to educate. And by educating, we can reduce the formation of these irritating DVPs. I, I couldn't <laughs> agree more. And whether she knew it or not, or whether you knew it or not, it's so on trend for the swimming pool industry, because that has been a major area of of discussion the last decade. It's air quality in indoor pools, the occupational hazard of working in indoor pools, the top 12 inches above the water. What are mm. high performance athletes? Let's say you're swimming for two, three hours a day, seven days a week, but you're inhaling whatever oh. that concentration of air is immediately above the water surface. Um, and, and as a consultant who's involved with pool projects, it's like construction and renovation, there's a shocking number of people who don't realize that air engineering is a specialty and that engineering the air for a pool is going to be far different from a library or a community center in terms of what we need to evacuate uh, the contaminants in the air. And we've seen a lot of cases of situations, whether it's lifeguards working without air handling, getting pneumonia and other medical conditions that we're looking at, you know, what is the long term effect, coughing, asthma, respiratory conditions. Um, so yeah, it's it's totally uh, it's totally our jam in the pool industry right now. Oh, yeah, well, I'm so happy. And like I said to you before as well last week, I'm always happy to talk about if you ever want like, uh, like a presentation on like drinking water quality too. I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to do whatever I can get into some niche thing. I love to talk about this. And I know that this was more of a lecture, just me talking at everyone. But I'm always happy to like slow it down or do a condensed version where it can be more of a discussion throughout the whole talk as well. Well, thanks so much for being here today. We This is Lindsay Blackstock at Thompson yeah, River University in British Columbia. So awesome. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. I'm just going to give a little bit of a recap what's coming up next week so you can head out, Lindsay. Okay, and bye. Thank you. All of the slides are available on the PowerPoint, or sorry, my brain. All of the slides are available on the show notes that are pinned in the chat box. If you're definitely like me, I'm going to have to go back and review some of those slides in terms of my scientific knowledge and understanding, but that's a good recording opportunity as well to revisit the topic and be able to redigest um, how how it applies to you, which I mean, fundamentally for us as aquatic managers is really just enforcing showering and enforcing education with our customers and being uh, educated about what that looks like in terms of the consequences, not fear mongering, not scaring people, but just saying, hey, peeing in the pool is not just about your inconvenience of getting out and going to the bathroom, but it could actually have long term consequences for water quality and the health of our uh, of our bathers. So that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us at a different time. On Wednesday, our session will also be in the afternoon, and then we will go back to our normal morning sessions on Friday. All of the sessions, as always, are being recorded, so you can look for those on our YouTube channel in the next couple of weeks. I'm going to leave it at that because it's dinner time for a lot of people after work. Thank you so much for being here. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll catch you on Wednesday in the afternoon for Ramsey Husseini multicultural perspectives on life saving in Australia in the afternoon because of the time change. Thanks so much. Have a great day, everyone.